Hi, everyone. Welcome to Should I Create a Podcast? Best Practices for Using Digital Media in the College Classroom. If you're not here in person um, and you're listening to this virtually, you still can participate in the workshop. What I'm going to do is during this recording, I will give you pauses for these different brainstorming exercises. So you can always download this presentation by uh, using the QR code that says follow along here. So I have had the Ivory Tower Boiler Room podcast for now three and a half years. Now the Ivory Tower Boiler Room is an arts and culture organization. It's a small business. Um, it started as a podcast, but it's now grown into small business social media marketing consulting, graduate student writing consulting, college admission essay consulting, and I even have um, expanded and am now working on actually creating podcasts for colleges and um, for those who are in the entertainment industry uh, have booked me too. So basically, you all are you all are getting a one on one crash course in even thinking about whether it's worth it for you individually to create a podcast for you to use podcast tools in your classroom, maybe even assigning podcasts to your students, or even assigning YouTube shows to your students. And you might ask, depending on the generation, why would I do either of these options? So hopefully you walk away with this, having learned a lot more about using these digital media tools. But even I'm going to give you a um, course on social media literacy. So why are you using certain social media platforms? Why use Facebook as a college educator or as um, a scholar, a writer, an artist, a performer? Um, why are you using Instagram? Why are you using X, which I'll go over some pros and cons of X right now because it's in a flux stage with Elon Musk. But also, maybe you thought about opening up a TikTok, but didn't know why you would even use TikTok. So I've used all the social media platforms. I'm on all of them. So here we go. Okay, the first is, should I create a podcast? Um, so this is my exercise for all of you, is jot down right now, what would your definition of a podcast be? So I'll pause the recording here to give you all a few minutes to just think about what your definition of a podcast is. And if you're not attending this workshop in person where I can actually talk to you, um, feel free to email me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com, or you can even direct message me on my Instagram um, at ivorytowerboilerroom, and you can let me know if you have any questions about this presentation you know, or what your definition of a podcast is. So I'm going to pause this for everyone. Okay, so I have with me Dr. Jan Balakian, who actually is from Kane University, um, but she gave a very good response that some of you probably have all jotted down. And I think it's important to note that um, Jan was actually on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, so uh, to talk about her play um, discussing the Armenian genocide. And what I love about your definition, Jan, is it is a podcast is something, it rhymes with broadcast, oh, right. but it's not a broadcast because it's not live. It's asynchronous. So it's something out of time that you can listen to as a consumer whenever you want to. Either you have Sirius XM in your car, maybe like me, you listen to Spotify, Maybe you have an iPhone, so you listen to Apple Podcasts, and you can just do that three-hour drive from Jersey to Long Island and listen to like four podcasts. So you as the listener and the consumer, people love podcasts because it's media on demand, and it's also you get to decide what topics and categories you want. Unlike when you turn on cable news, they already have it programmed for you. So there's an infinite variety of podcasts. So it actually comes from Ben Hams Hamserly in 2004 in The Guardian. P 
podcasting makes an appearance in 2004. So this is, you know, right after Y2K. And it really came about because it combines iPod and broadcast. What's Y2K? So Y2K was that millennium, like um, the internet's growth after 1999 into 2000, that like this turn of the century going into the new millennium was going to bring about a lot of technological changes. So the reason that it has iPod in it is because the iPod was what we were all using to listen to music. Remember, you would have to scroll. Okay, so the only podcasts that existed right away were Apple podcasts because you had to get them from your iPod. So there were not many podcasts in existence yet. There were only maybe under 10 um, because it was so hard to even access podcasts. Um, So it's user-friendly. Digital recording and editing tools, I'm going to explain to you all, they're free. So to start a podcast is actually free. Um, It's more getting over the learning curve of getting comfortable with using this technology. So in 2013, you can kind of mark the renaissance of podcasting. One billion subscribers were listening to podcasts on Apple in 2013. So it really took off from 2013 to now. There's been a huge resurgence of podcasts and now we can look back at the pandemic as a moment where podcasting really, um, everyone wanted to get their hands on creating one because we all were in lockdown. We were trying to listen to new material. You know, you couldn't really go in person to lectures or to museums. So we all were turning to anything we could consume as media. So like I said, it rhymes with broadcast, but broadcasts are live. Podcasts are not live, but there are ways you can make your podcast live if you ever want to interact with an audience. So I'll get go over that later. Um, you have more creative freedom over topics and conversations you're listening to. So what I'm going to do right now as a task is if you're thinking of assigning a podcast to your students, Go to Spotify.com and say, oh no, what's a book we're currently reading? Or is it all the all the craze right now? We just did indignation. Okay. So Philip Roth's indignation, I have as an example. So if you type in Philip Roth indignation on Spotify, I'd click podcasts and shows at the top. And then look, there's I actually really love this podcast. It's called The History of Literature. And episode 348 was all about Philip Roth's biography. So the episode description, I call them the show notes, but episode descriptions are so important because we're getting the thesis of what this discussion is about. So like if students were going to cite this podcast, they'd really rely on the episode description to quote from as a source. But just like any other source, podcasts are not free from uh, misinformation. If anything, I actually think podcasts are a great critical reasoning tool for students because misinformation proliferates in media spaces because you're not sure who they're citing. So you could actually assign, say, Philip Roth with this guest, Uh, Mike Palindrome, who I'm assuming has experience about Philip Roth. Maybe he's a scholar of Philip Roth. Um, And you could ask your students, listen to this episode and write a response about who are they turning to for their information about Philip Roth? Mm -hmm. Are they quoting biographers? Are they quoting a PBS series about Philip Roth? Like they're turning to someone for information. So that would be a great lesson about citing your sources in the podcast space. Okay. But, you know, you literally could search anything and there's probably going to be a podcast topic. I mean, I had on a biographer about Madeline Kahn and he wrote this bio. So say you're assigning Young Frankenstein or 
um, you know, Madeline Kahn and Clue, uh, the movie. Like this would be a great way for you to learn more about her life. So podcasts are a great supplemental source for any discussion. I mean, one of my favorite lessons is when I had my Broadway musical class and I interviewed Gregory Maguire about Wicked, you could assign, you know, Wicked and then make sure that you listen to my Gregory Maguire episode um, called No One Mourns the Wicked and it'll give you more information about his writing process. Nice. Say you're assigning Stephen King's Carrie, same thing. Say you're assigning a movie. There's a lot of film podcasts. There's a lot of Broadway podcasts. Um, basically, the options are endless. Any kind of topic, you, your politics, if you're a political scientist, there's so many political podcasts. Okay, so the next section is, you know, tips on whether or not to start a podcast. First, know the definition of a podcast. So we've kind of now... You know the definition of a podcast. Know the genre of a podcast. Who is your target audience? And why are you doing this podcast? If you can't answer any of these questions, then you're probably not ready to start a podcast on your own. These are all questions I had to wrestle with as my podcast has evolved. Um, during the pandemic, my podcast started as a grad student and scholarly academic based podcast as I was finishing my PhD. But then it turned into, let me use this as a classroom tool to uh, assign authors who I could interview and then my students could ask them questions. So like they asked Gregory Maguire questions that I then read on air with him. They, um, you know, had ideas for other authors I should interview. So they became part of the community. If you are more comfortable being the voice in your podcast, you might not want your students to interview the author themselves because authors, you know, high profile authors can be intimidating. Oh, yeah. Not because they're not kind, but they are so used to press that they're expecting a threshold of questions that you can't expect undergrad students to all of a sudden become Terry Gross, sure. you know? But if you're very comfortable, they can submit questions and you say, oh, Sarah asks you, Terry Gross, why did you decide that fresh air was the best way for you to become an arts and culture personality? Mm -hmm. Like, so then at least they still are part of the community. Um, so that's a good way if you want to bring your podcast to the classroom. Another way is I think just starting to assign episodes to your students at least lets you know whether or not they would be invested in actually being part of creating a podcast. And then I will get into, there are ways actually to create a podcast that the public never hears. And that might be a good way if you're a creative writer professor, you can have your students read their stories and contribute to a podcast. So, you know, Jan wrote a fictional story about Arthur Miller. That could be an episode. I wrote a story about, you know, being a New Jersey, New Yorker. That could be right. an episode. So it doesn't have to be listened to by the world. You know, it doesn't have to be distributed to the public. Um, there are ways to limit who gets access. So, and I also would say if you're at a college, especially if you're at a high school, but if you're at a college, a lot of media that gets disseminated to the public is going to have to go through an administration consent process. They might have to sign forms, the students, like think about if you're going to have your students on a YouTube show, um, are they legally allowed to have their voices distributed to the public? So you'd have to talk to your media relations team or at least your department chair first to make sure that if, if your students want their podcast to become public, then make sure you at least 
go through the proper channels before you start doing all of this creative process. Um, okay. So here's my exercise. Think right now about if you were going to create a podcast for one of your college courses, what content would you want students to create? Like, what do you think students would most likely want to contribute to? And why would it be good as a podcast? Say, why hear a voice rather than them writing? Like, what would be your ideal podcast? Um, as an example for you all who are listening, um, you've, you know, say some of you are even having a hard time thinking of how would this even look in my classroom? Um, if you're teaching world literature, which is probably, I would say, the number one course that you have to teach yes. as an English educator in college, um, I would say, why not do mini podcast episodes? So your final research project for your students, yeah. instead of a research paper, it could be a research podcast. So the research podcast could be each student has to choose one of these world lit texts and they have to do a 10 minute mini episode highlighting, you know, mm -hmm. recording themselves and making it translatable to the public. So why is Gilgamesh's epic what makes it so fascinating as that Babylonian epic and being, you know, one of the first Western texts that gets orally transmitted, right, as an oral narrative. So that would be one student's task. And, you know, what what would be, you think, what would students get out of that project having to record an episode to the public that makes... Gilgamesh impactful to say someone who loves going to their public library, yes. but they're not going to look into scholarly texts about Gilgamesh. Like what makes that more interesting, you think, than having your students do a final research paper about Gilgamesh? Well, I guess the medium, because it's 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 similar to doing research, right? But it's just the medium. It's the medium, and then it also will teach again. I think, I think digital media is always in addition to the foundation. So you're always going to have your students writing, right? But like, I always like to do digital media projects as my final project, and I do my writing as like a midterm essay, writing responses along the way, like close reading analyses. And then you use that writing so that they're then already thinking about what their podcast episode would be. So this student has already been thinking about Gilgamesh. This, but, uh, they would have done the earlier text, so the, the, the final would not be cum accumulative. They would have they would just be writing about the last few texts. So what would it be? Um, the last few, um, like a Midsummer Night's Dream and Ibsen and uh, a contemporary. Yes, yes. So I think that what students, especially now, are going to get out of that is getting industrial media experience yeah and seeing that oh wow my humanities degree especially my english degree yes is translatable to media careers nice. so it already gets them outside of the ivory tower thinking nice where of course they're always going to be translatable as educators that never goes away but now they're translatable as interning for say npr they could intern for NPR. They could intern for, I had interns for Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Someone interned recently for NBC Universal in Florida, in Miami. Yeah. So they're starting to land more. Media careers are growing. Um, and, you know, K through 12 education is in need. But I think if they have this media experience, it only makes them even more marketable. So I'm trying to envision how this is actually different from them 
doing, like, let's say, research and putting it into a PowerPoint. So they would be recording it. They would be record. So let's say they're doing, um, like, the multiple plots yeah. in Midsummer Night's Dream, and they would be comparing all the different lovers. Yeah, let me show you. One of my, I think a podcast that does this well is called um, Greek Myth. Let's talk about myths. That's what it's called. And I really like her podcast, Liv Albert. She um, is a histor um, a historian of Greek mythology. Okay. So hers are longer episodes with scholars, but like there's one episode where it's called um, Zeus, King of the Gods and Creepy Old Man Who Tricks Women. And it's all about Zeus and him being that like seductor. So um, I think she even has a trailer Maybe. Okay. If not, I'll go over like why you would want to have a podcast trailer. But yeah, here we go. Mini myth. Daphne, the nymph who said, hell no, Apollo. Okay. It's funny. It also is about the Apollo and Daphne myth, myth story. So like if you were teaching myth yeah, or if you want your final research paper as a world lit course to be about Greek mythology, each student would choose a mythological story yeah, and they have to you know, bring it from that academic jargon and they have to make it something where, you know, their parent could listen as they're cooking dinner and they would enjoy no, isn't that the, the topic. Isn't that similar to what they would do in a PowerPoint or in a, um, just an oral presentation? It is, but at least now they have a lasting it's footprint. Yeah. It's recorded. And the goal is even if it doesn't reach the public, there's always that possibility that someone listening across the world would gain knowledge from that episode. Or in the basic facts of class, if a bunch of people were out that day, they, they could listen to now to this episode. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also something where if you're a university who multiple instructors are starting to assign a pod, like this podcast final project, yes, you all can share the podcast with each other and create a repository. So that way for the major, right. everyone can use this as everyone uses a database. Uses. Yeah. Everyone can use it. And, um, you're all contributing. I mean, it's a, in a way, it's like, so students post their responses to discussion questions. It's just yet a more sophisticated version of that. Yeah, it's a more, um, it's a more, um, I would say, audio, it uses more of your senses. I would say. So it's, the, it's audio. I, I, lo I love the way you use music also in between. Yeah. Yeah. So like there's a production value. Yeah. So it's a show, you know, it's more, it's a performance rather than something static. Got it. Um, it's like, why would you want to go, why going to Broadway is different than going to the movie theater. They're both interesting visual mediums for film and theater, but theater does something emotionally that film doesn't always do. Do because it's live. Yeah, or you seeing a film in your house is different than going to the movie theater. Because, because there's an audience and there's the experience. Just like podcasts, there's the experience of you feeling that you're in the room with that person. So one of my favorite things is when people listen to my episodes and they reach out to me and they say, I really connected with such and such point, or, you know, you made me rethink my views on a topic. Yeah. Like there is something where they feel that they can connect to you. Um, okay. So I think that's all really helpful. Um, okay. And then this is just how my podcast looks. So right now I'm just going to play the trailer for um, my podcast. And I think that'll help understand like what is a podcast trailer even um it's the audio of a movie trailer exactly so yeah like jan said it's the audio of a movie trailer 
Have you ever thought, how does everyone know about this current book? And why are they running to the bookstores and libraries to get their hands on it? Or everyone's talking about this TV show, but I feel like I'm binging it months after all of my friends and family. Well, then I have a podcast for you. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Rimby, the host and director of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, an arts and culture podcast. We discuss here LGBTQ plus society and culture, literature, TV, film, true crime, academic conversations, and pop culture. You can listen to us wherever you get podcasts, specifically Spotify and Apple. Make sure that you follow us on Spotify or Apple, rate and review us, and follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Ivory Tower Boil the Room. We hope you enjoy the podcast. What's so good about a trailer is if you're going to start a podcast um, and you want to do it for your own personal use, like say you're a writer um, or you have a project you're you're going to promote. Mm -hmm. I always say, if you're going to create a podcast now, because there's so many, Mm -hmm. what are you promoting? Again, it's not an infomercial, but there has to be a reason. I interview guests because they're amplifying or promoting um, either a book they just came out with a TV show they're on, um, a new project they're doing. So you really only get guests if there is a reason for them to have their voice amplified, you know, because time is money. And in this case, when you do podcasts, you usually don't ask guests. um, You don't pay guests. It's basically you're doing media exposure for them for publicity. So it's like, okay, well, why, you know, um, I just had on um trying to think. I just had uh Rashid Newson, an author who actually is a producer of uh, Bel Air, that TV show. And he um wrote a book called My Government Means to Kill Me, which is all about um the black queer black male experience and kind of is like a new um uh, visionary version of James Baldwin meets Moonlight in a way. So Great. We talked a lot about his book, but I also talked about, you know, where does he see queer black male narratives now in 2024? Like, what does the future look like for the queer black male experience in Hollywood, especially? So all of that is I want you all to walk away with, okay, you've learned more about the queer black male experience from him than when you first began that podcast. So, you know, when you start a podcast, and you're thinking of episodes, your students, even if they're creating something, you know, it could even be now my audience knows more about um, the myth of Apollo and Hyacinth. Like they might not even know, they knew who Apollo was kind of, but they didn't know that Apollo was um, a queer male mythological figure. So it's the same as a research paper. There's a thesis and your podcast episode has to have a thesis. It's an oral research. Oral research paper. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's the, why are you doing this podcast? You're enriching your listeners. So you need to know, and your students actually, as one of the assignments before they even start recording should be, why am I doing this? Like, why does my listener care? right? We only have a few hours in the day. Anything that we listen to should be important and should be something we walk away with. Again, there is a lot of podcasts that are comedy podcasts. They want you to laugh and that can be it. That's okay. I'm not saying that this podcast has to, you know, um, solve quantum mechanics of a rocket ship, right? It could be we laugh, you laugh at my content. But you just have to know what your mission is. Um, Okay. So we're going to now, this is fun. This is the interactive element. So I said this because I think it's very true, especially having a PhD in English. A podcast is like a literary text. It has a multitude of genres, just like a TV show, just like film, just like drama. It's a text and all texts 
have genres. Um, Terry Eagleton would like it. Yes. Yeah. I love Terry Eagleton. Okay. Uh, I was trained well. Okay. So we're going to place each of these podcasts in its appropriate genre or genres if you think there's more than one. So here are some different podcast genres. Education, which I would say the ivory tower boil the room. I consider myself an education podcast because we mix highbrow discussions with pop culture. So it's a blending, but you're always walking away having learned more nuance about that arts and culture topic. So that's why I would say we're an education podcast. We're not a news podcast and we're deaf. We could news. We're not politics. Um, we could be society and culture, but I would say society and culture is more, is part of literature, but society and culture would be more if I was just shooting the shit about, um, you know, Duncan's new coffee. Like that's co like, or, you know, what is it like being, um, a gay man on fire Island right now? Right. But I'm always every one of my episodes. Being female. Yeah. Always is like you attending one of my college classes where I'm giving you texts yes. to do further research yourself. So right. that's education. Um, you could be an interview. So I'm also an interview podcast, too. Um, conversational is I would say conversational. Um would be more like, say, Bill Maher just talking about the state of affairs or Joe Ro or Seth. Um, no, Joe Rogan would be conversational. Stewart. Yes, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, comedy. Um, Chelsea Handler fits into comedy. Um, they yeah, they yeah. I would say Stephen Colbert is a political comedian, so that's a mix. News, NPR news. I always listen to their updates every day for five minutes. That's news. Politics. There's a lot of pol political podcasts. Um, true crime. So we have a section called True Crime and Academia. So the way it works is Ivory Tower Boiler Room is I'm a network. And then I have shows under the network. So we do have a true crime show that Mary DePippi hosts. Um, storytelling would be Say you wanted your students to read their poems as a podcast episode. That's storytelling. Okay. Um, or they're reading a one-act play and having a cast perform it as a podcast episode. There's some podcasts where I listen to Shakespeare plays being performed by a cast. That would be storytelling. You mean red? I mean, uh, red, red. Mm-hmm. I consider storytelling the most similar to audiobooks. Yeah. So audiobooks are storytelling podcasts. Arts. Arts would be like if the Metropolitan Museum of Art had a podcast and they were going to go over their new exhibitions. That would be more just arts. Society and culture. Business. Um, Susie Orman. I think she has a podcast. I'd consider her business. Yeah. Um, if Shark Tank had a podcast, I'd consider them business. Um, drama. Drama would be um, like the actor studio having a podcast and giving you how-to advice for the acting business or being an acting student. That's more drama. But not the reading of a play. That, I would say a reading of a play is storytelling. Mm-hmm. Sports, ESPN, any podcast they have commentating, definitely sports. Jason and Travis Kelsey's podcast, sports. Pop culture, if you're talking a lot about celebrity drama, gossip, current headlines in entertainment, um, that's pop culture. Okay, so we're going to look at a few. So let's start with Ebony. She's, all of these people, I either, I either know them I listen to the podcast or they've been on my podcast. So Ebony K. Williams has a JD and um, she's been on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So hers is called Holding Court. So what would you consider this? Here's our description. 
When law and order is the headline, what does it mean for us? Holding Court with Ebony K. Williams cross-examines newsmaking cases and famous faces to peer into the court of law. So each week you're joined by attorney Ebony K. Williams and her cultural observer, Dustin Ross, to break down what's on the docket in American justice. Okay. So breaking down law, yeah, breaking down the law and order yeah. topics. Or society. Um, is it culture though? I agree. I think it's, I think it's a blend of politics and society and culture. Yeah. Okay. Sarah Fraser, um, her show, another friend of my podcast. Okay, so she says she's a com a comedy podcast. It's a daily podcast that features hot takes on pop culture and reality shows. So I would say she fits nicely into comedy and society and culture and pop culture. So she's kind of a mix, a hybrid. Um I have my friend Taylor Ferber, Cancel Me Baby. Um, cancel Me Baby, let's see. That would be politics. It's political and it's also cultural. Mm. Yeah, so it says... Um, her irreverent show empowers viewers to think freely outside rules around... Wokeism, conservatism, men, women, media, and culture. It's political and cultural. Though. Yep, political and cultural. Okay. Uh, uh, we've already talked about, let's talk about Myths Baby, Sex, Love, Literature, a pop culture podcast. So I would actually say, you know, you're having um, society, culture, pop culture, and arts because they're literature. Um Okay, that old gay classic cinema. How about Christian Garcia having a podcast about cinema that interprets it from a queer lens? So it's called culture and it is also society, society and culture. Yeah, and arts mm -hmm. because it's film. Yeah. Um, okay, so we could go on and on, but I think everyone understands what podcast genres are okay so if you create a podcast can you imagine who your ideal listener would be right so if you're a writer and you're a writer of plays who would be your ideal listener who would you want picking this up and going for a run mm -hmm. and listening to you reading your plays or having a performance. Who would that be? Theater goers. Theater goers. Goers. Maybe people who can't go afford to go to the theater all the time. So then that could be students. It could be teachers. Mm -hmm. It could be any. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to be students or teachers. It could be anybody. Mm-hmm. Retirees. Um, it could yeah, be and how, how how do you know what somebody's interests are? Yeah. So I broke down here for everyone to use my podcast as a case study. So I'm gonna go over this because I think it's very helpful even for my knowledge. Um, so I know I'm standing right now in the presentation, but you can look at this PowerPoint with me. So I actually know all of these statistics. Once you start a podcast you start to get demographic information, which is very helpful. So I know that 81% of my listeners, and I have now over 26,000 downloads of my podcast, meaning 26,000 people have listened to an episode. And it could be like someone listening to multiple episodes, but that's 26,000 individual plays, which like I figure a whole town has heard my podcast which yeah, good. is awesome. Okay, so 81% come from the United States. And then outside of that, 
um, 5% come from the United Kingdom, 4% from Canada, 2% from Germany, 2% from Australia, and then it lists all the other countries that listen. So from the US, the majority of podcast listeners, not just for me, but for all the podcast friends I know, most come from New York City, New Jersey, New Jersey um, and the West Coast. You get a lot of Los Angeles and California listeners. So it seems like podcasts do very well in America on the coast. And does that have a correspondence to arts and culture? And Probably. Also, and also those are the more liberal pockets. So. Yeah, it could be about, um, yes, uh, liberalism, education. Yeah, there's definitely correlations. Um, 62.5% are women who listen to my podcast. Yeah, 32.5% are male and 2.5% are non-binary. Um, I have a lot of LGBTQ discussions. I wonder if that sure. is having anything to do with it. Also, um, yeah, a lot of my friends are... Um, they say that the majority of their podcast listeners are women. So it seems like podcasts do very well with the a female demographic. Well, they say that's true of book reading, culture, general. Yeah. So um, 70% listen on um, an iPhone or Apple podcasts. That's probably because a lot of people, unlike myself, have an iPhone. I don't want an iPhone, but I appreciate anyone who listens on Apple podcasts. Um, 11.7% listen on Spotify. And then here's your age group for podcast listeners. Um, the majority are going to be between my age group, 28 to 34, the millennials. Make up a lot of listeners. And I think that has to do with how we were trained with technology and that we're working more virtual jobs. And we have that time to consume podcasts with our work. Um, the next group actually is 30 to 44. So millennial to Gen X, which I find interesting. Um, then it's the Gen, the millennials to the Gen Zers, 23 to 27. And then I'm kind of split between 18 to 22, the college age undergrads and 45 to 59. No, actually I have the same percent for those who are over 60, as I do for those who are 45 to 59. That's interesting. And then my smallest group are those who are zero to 17, which makes sense because I have a lot of adult conversations. So I'm glad that it's not too high. Um, well, when you say adult, meaning, meaning like explicit, um, you know, um, adult oriented topics, I'll say like college level topics, um, sexuality, queerness, um, you know, getting into political mm -hmm. arts and culture discussions. Okay, so what will it cost? This is probably the number one question I get. It actually will cost you nothing at the beginning. Um, you just need to know what app to use. So. What I use is called Spotify for Podcasters. And this is where if you have questions, you can email me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com. But I use Spotify for Podcasters. Um, you could just type in Spotify for Podcasters. Easiest way to make a podcast. I agree. Um, I've been using it since 20, um, 20. Um, and I haven't changed. So, you know, it's actually a free data, um, a free podcast uh, software. What I love about it is um, if you can use um, social media or if you know how to create a website, the learning curve is pretty small to actually get, like, figure out how to use the software. Mm -hmm. um, the way I actually record podcast episodes is like what I'm doing now. I use Zoom. So if you have a Zoom account, all you have to do is record your conversation. 
Mm-hmm. And then you can use Spotify for podcasters to edit the episode. Um, yeah. So I would say record on Zoom, in my opinion. I think Zoom, the quality is actually very good. Um, right now, I don't have a microphone, but usually I have like a microphone I bought for $40. I've used it since 2021. Um, I have, if I'm actually like with a guest, I have a light that I bought for $20, a ring light that just illuminates my face and makes it, you know, glow and look better on video. Mm -hmm. I do that for social media purposes usually. Um, Okay. What I like about Spotify for podcasters is it distributes your podcast for you. So you don't have to worry about Okay, is it going to be heard on Spotify? Is it go- going to be heard on Apple or Amazon or iHeartRadio? This software, literally, say you release that episode about Philip Roth's indignation, it will distribute it too. I'll show you with mine. You can hear the Ivory Tower Boiler Room on one one, two, three, four, five, six, seven podcast platforms. And I don't even control that. That's just because it gets distributed to all of those platforms. Um, well, for student presentations, uh, um, unless they want to distribute their presentation elsewhere, uh, would they be achieving the same effect if they... Um, just recorded it on a Zoom, a presentation on a Zoom. So in other words, isn't this for dissemination? Like if they wanted to send this to people all over, mm-hmm. then they would do a podcast. But if they're using it for the purposes of class, classroom presentation, um, do they actually need to do a podcast? I would say... Doing a podcast is different than a presentation in that they're going to have to learn the behind the scenes of media creation. So, you know, creating, yeah. Let's see, they could record it, right? Like, Oh, you're saying if they recorded a presentation, could they then release it as a podcast episode? Well, let me let you finish what you were saying. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Um. Okay, I would say if you're still on the fence about whether or not you would have your students create a podcast as a classroom. They're just using yeah. it for class, yeah. Yeah, this is a question about who's on your team because what a podcast lets you do that an individual presentation doesn't, I mean, you could do a group presentation, but if I know that Dan is doing an episode on... um Um, let me choose a text that's popular. Um, he's going to do an episode on where the crawdad sings. And I also was going to do an episode on where the crawdad sings. Mm-hmm. It does work like a group re- presentation. I see that metaphor. I think though, where a podcast helps is that you actually then can join a team together and create an episode together on Zoom. Okay. And it allows for you to be virtual and not have to be in person doing a group presentation. So there's more flexibility. No. Um, so maybe this is good for shy students. Yes, I think a podcast is actually um, less intimidating than in-person presentations. Um, or if they're on the Shire side, they might be the person who wants to edit the podcast. Maybe they're going to do more of the um, audio editing, what we call audio editing engineering, but they're going to be the one in the production side of things. So that could be a great way for them to contribute. Maybe they're the one who's going to create the cover design for the episode. So like, Now, all of my podcasts have a cover design. Um, So like here was one with um, John Colin Gruzer about academia and freefall. But 
if I go to my podcast, like maybe that student wants to do, um, this was from my Leah Remini Scientology book club episode, but maybe they're the one who's going to design the cover for the episode. Um, right. So if you assigned Leah Remini's book, the episode could be the group could do an episode about her book mm -hmm. and that can translate to any text you're reading um, or film you're discussing in a film studies class mm -hmm. or a TV show. This is the fun part, what you can and can't control. But I would say there are pros and cons for if you're going to create a podcast, I've heard so many academics who um, want to create their own individual podcast. And then, they're like, then they'll say, well, should I have my friend join me? And I said, you know, one of you is going to have to be the main, one of you is going to do the majority of work. And it's okay if your friend comes on once in a while, but I really advise against you both um, trying to co-host a podcast because people's schedules don't line up someone's heart is going to be in it more than someone else's. And in my situation, unfortunately, it led to the breaking up of a friendship. And I want people to avoid, you know, because I... Because of disagreements. Disagreements. And I wanted to turn this into a small business, which it now is. Mm -hmm. um, the other person saw it as a hobby. Uh, and there were irreconcilable differences from that. So, you know, know that you do not need someone else to make a podcast, but if it makes you comfortable, rely on a person, say in your department, someone else wants to do a podcast, but they can only do something once every other month mm -hmm. as an episode, but you're going to do it two a month. Then that person can come on once every other month and do their own their own episode and you just put it under your podcast title. Yeah. Why have them create their own podcast right. if you've already created one? Yeah. So basically you can see it as podcast is a collaborative room. Mm -hmm. And who are you going to allow into your classroom? Not everyone has to create their own classroom. Yeah. They could be a visiting lecturer that day. So it's the same concept. And I think that's why a lot of people don't even even do anything in podcasting because they get so overwhelmed and intimidated that they have to create their own individual one and um, they have to make it so successful. Why not try to team up with someone who already has a podcast and do your own show every once in a while mm -hmm. or even go on as a guest host? Like, you know, if I want to have, I've had Sarah Fraser, who's an expert on pop culture. I don't cover reality TV every week. Like if you see my podcast, I'm not doing that every week. She comes on as the expert reality TV scholar into my space. And I go on her space as that academic literary mind. So you have to know each other's strengths and what your personality is. Just like, when you listen, yeah, or when you listen to a morning show, there's a reason why they have the experts come on Kelly and Ripa or the Good Morning America. They're coming on to give their medical advice or whatever specialty they are. Mm -hmm. The same thing. This is a show. Yeah. Like you're creating a show. Yeah. And maybe you'd rather be a guest and that's okay. Um Okay, what can you control and what can't you control? This is important. You can control um, your creative freedom. This is what has always um, excited me about podcasts and why I love doing, why I continue it, is you get to have that academic and creative freedom of expression around who you have on your show. Now, if you're at a university and this is not your personal podcast and this is for a classroom and you're getting students involved, this is where you need to make sure that 
you go through your department chair or a point person to make sure that if this can be heard by the public, you're not doing any topics that the university will try to shut down your podcast. Of course. So that's where there's a difference between you doing a personal show and you doing a classroom show. And then if they say, well, you can do this privately with your own class, then just do it as an exercise. Or if they say you can share this with your department, but not the public, Mm -hmm. then that's a good option to go. And maybe you'll learn a lot of advice that you eventually want to create your own show because of the experience you've had with your classroom. And then you would have that creative freedom over a show about um, a new book that you're writing on artificial intelligence in Dr. Mia Zamora's case or whoever is going to create a podcast. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, And if you're not me and you're listening to this, then whatever book you're currently working on. Okay. You get to control the schedule of your content and collaborating with other podcasters. You also get to control what social media platforms you use to market the podcast. Okay, what can you not do? You can't go live on a podcast, but you can use social media to go live on a podcast. So on Instagram, there's a way on Instagram, and I'm not going to get into all of this right now. Again, you can like um, email me or, you know, if you want to hire me as a consultant, I can actually give you all the like behind the scenes of this. But, and I would say this is a bells and whistle. This isn't something you all have to do. I just think it's good if you do want to interact with an audience. I like doing it once in a while. I'll actually release my podcast episode and I'll go live on my social media and have a camera facing me as I'm listening to one of my episodes and I'll react to the episode in real time. Mm -hmm. So like I'll react to um, that author I had on and say, oh, yeah, what they're saying right now, I'll basically be, I'll commentate my own podcast. Mm -hmm. Like I'll say, oh, I would have asked them that question too. I wonder what they think of that. Mm -hmm. Or I'll ask everyone, if you go live on Instagram, people can watch you and people will write me messages and say, oh, what do you think that, what do you think the author would have thought about this? Or I just read their book, you know, you've helped, like, what do you think about this topic? I've done this even watching TV. I've gone live watching a TV show and providing an analysis. I did it with the Real Housewives and gave a real-time analysis of the behind the scenes. Right. And I think that's a good way to interact live with your audience. Um, Okay. You can't control how the audience is going to respond to your podcast. Never. No. It's It's like class. It's like being an actor, you know? So once you go public and once you want to promote your podcast on social media, I get some wild comments on social media. Some negative. Some negative things. Um, Inevitable. The majority are always positive. The negatives never outweigh the the positive. Right. You have to, if you're going to do this and you want to be in the public eye, which I now am in the public eye, you have to let it go. Um, You can't control the personality of your guests. I've had some guests who really love being in the public eye. And then I've had some who wanted me to take down a clip because it was getting negative comments. You have to handle guests on a one-on-one basis. Also, if a guest seems very hesitant to come on your podcast, don't force them. Let them come to it at their own time. You don't want to force someone if they're going to be uncomfortable. Um, You also can't control whether or not social media will deem your content controversial. So expect that if you're talking about anything that relates around trauma, abuse, uh, child actors and abuse. Um, So you can't control if social media is going to deem your content controversial or not. You can't control how social media is going to um, 
monitor some of your content. So I've had content on my podcast where I have um, talked about cults. We had a Scientology discussion. Um, we've done, um, I've shared content about child actors being abused. Um, I've talked about, you know, queer male sexuality and some social media, it's okay when you post topics like that. Others said that um, I was against community guidelines and they took the post down. So, you know, yeah. So expect if you're doing- Community we're talking about. Well, someone reported it as offensive. Um, so- um, But I didn't realize there were any guidelines for, for the podcast. Well, so when you create a podcast, you have that freedom of speech and creative freedom to post what you want. But if you promote it on Instagram, TikTok, X, Facebook, some of those social media platforms will deem your content, whoever is watching your content could deem it inappropriate and take it down. So just be ready to know that if you're dealing with what could be deemed controversial, you're probably going to have to handle some social media monitoring. When you start to put out your podcast, realize that you are not going to be a perfectionist when you're creating a podcast. Resist writing perfection at all costs. Fortunately, I don't have that problem. So, you know, think when you write show notes for a podcast, you're creating a thesis statement. That's gripping. You're creating a headline like you would in an article for um, a magazine. You're not going to write a research paper for your podcast show notes. Okay, so think thesis statement rather than research paper. Remember that a podcast is always in a constant state of flux and is evolving. So start with the basics. Start with a simple picture for your podcast episodes. And then when you want to start to add the bells and whistles, like I have, my interns have helped me with this, then you start as you're developing. So, you know, you could just start with, like Taylor Ferber here has a cancel me baby. You know, she has her cover art for her episodes. So that I would say, keep it simple. It works and it isn't confusing, but now that I've had the podcast for a while, I know how to start doing more of these, what I would call, um, that's actually my boyfriend there, but more of these glitzy and glamorous covers. So this was for Saltburn and discussing Saltburn. Then you can start to add more designs to your work. Well, there are two backs there, which and Tristan Pullen is my, um, is a director. Also, so that's Tristan. And then that's my boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then you see our logo for the ivory tower boiler room mm -hmm. is in the middle still. So never get rid of your logo. You can always build around your logo, but always make sure someone knows what show this is. Okay. And then nearing the end of the presentation, this is actually advice. And if you're all watching me on Instagram live, this is advice for social media. Why are you using different social media platforms to begin with? So for all of you out there and those in the room, are you scared of social media? When you post to social media, do you go on social media? Do you go on to TikTok or Instagram or Facebook? Do you go in with a plan? When you're posting, do you say with self-awareness, Oh, I'm posting because this amplifies this small business, or this will connect me to the theater community for a show that I'm about to audition for. You know, I like to think of social media as a way to amplify and promote your voice, whatever voice that is. That could be your professional voice. That could be what you do in your personal life. That could be amplifying the poor Jefferson library I go to and showing that they have an event coming up. It could be for Women's History Month. And I saw that the Soapbox and Crank Cycle, my clients I work for are doing women's history events. 
or not women's history, but they're women business owners and I want to promote women's month for them. Have a plan when you go on social media. Should be like that. For emails. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, always I say when you use technology, have some self-awareness of why you're doing what you're doing. And of course, you can have fun on social media, but if you're going to post, there should be a purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's my ivory tower social media. And here's questions that I like to just ask. Ask yourself these questions. You don't have to have had you don't have to have a small business. You don't have to have a podcast. This could just be your own personal social media. One, are you self-aware about why you're posting what you're posting? Two, who is your audience and why are they following you? Are they fellow professors? Are they writers? Maybe they want to know that you're brainstorming a current book or you're brainstorming a new play. Let them know. Say, I'm a... I'm struggling right now with the idea of my play. What do you all think? You know, I like to use social media as a creative hive. I do use it as, um, what do they call those? Think tanks. Sometimes I'll use social media as a creative think tank. But no, you don't have to always ask social media followers their opinion. Know when to stop asking opinions. And that goes for in person too. Um, are you using all the tools to your advantage? On Instagram, you can't actually, Instagram is better for videos and photos. Instagram, you can't use links in a post. You can only, only use links in a story. Make sure you know the limitations. TikTok is excellent with videos. Um, and you can put photos on TikTok, but TikTok is better for videos. Never used TikTok. What, what is it? So TikTok would be great. Like if you're um, workshopping a play, you would want to show the behind the scenes of the play, like the cast. It's a visual? It's a visual. Okay. TikTok is like, a, TikTok is an easier to use YouTube, basically. Nice. Okay. Um, I can show you an example, actually. That way it makes sense. So this is the ivory tower boiler room TikTok. Okay. So I just posted this about podcast tips. Let me see. Creating the podcast in the first place. This might sound silly, but so many people who start a podcast don't get past a few months because they don't even know what the mission is of their podcast to begin with. So I'll use my own podcast as a case study. So the Ivory Tower Boiler Room is an arts and culture podcast. Okay, so I was giving a tip there about podcasting. Um, okay, I went for a run yesterday and I'm excited about Beyonce's new album. So that was something more to promote my fitness journey. Nice. Um, so as you can see, TikTok is really good at videos. It's basically, you're your own, you're your own um, channel. And you just download it as an app? Yep, you download it as an app. Um, so do you use social media as a teaching tool in the classroom? Have you ever created an Instagram page for your class? that students could contribute to. That could be a good project. Maybe you could cre create a world literature and mythology Instagram page. So that's another, if you don't want to yet do a podcast because it does require more work. No, because the students would do it. Well, the students would do it, that's true. But you could even start with them creating an Instagram page for the podcast they'll do in the classroom mm -hmm. as a way for them to start generating ideas. Um, okay. So these are all like extras. These are all about bells and whistles. It's about how do you make money from this? This is if not with the college classroom, but this is if you want to start to monetize. So this is where I'm not going to get really deep into this because this will be more for those who want to make this into a business. 
So you can reach out to me if you want to make your podcast into a business because I've started doing that process. And a lot of it involves trying to get members and subscription services. There's a whole network you create. Okay. So are you not yet ready to create a podcast? That's okay. You know, why should you even assign podcast episodes or YouTube shows to a class? Yeah, yeah. So students can learn how to apply close reading to digital media. They can learn about career paths for humanities majors. Students might decide that they want to intern for a podcast that they really like. Maybe now they think they want to intern for a media company. These are opportunities they can only get if they're being assigned media in the classroom. If not, they don't think that it's a highbrow topic to look at. Okay. And here's all my resources. Um, I love NPR's podcast startup guide. It's an ex uh, guy Roz does a lot with that Mm -hmm. um, because of the shows that he's done. uh, TEDx Radio Hour. Um, So that's a great resource to start with. And again, everyone can contact me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com. And if you were listening to this and not in person, please feel free to reach out to me with any other questions. And remember that you can hire me as a consultant. The first hour is $30 and then I'll decide a price based on um, up to $40. I don't go past $40. So we'll decide what works best for you.